With last season's successes at Schalke still fresh in the memory, we've hit the job market. But FM never quite works out like you're expecting it to. So at the end of last episode, we were making some fabulous plans. Will we go to Sevilla if they sack their boss? If Marseille dispense with the services of their manager, will we end up there? What about a second season in Germany? And when Borussia Mönchengladbach sack their manager? We'll jump into the hot seat. Not a bit of it. Those jobs never materialised. In fact, no jobs at really big clubs materialised at all during the summer. There weren't even any ones that we could put a speculative CV in front of to try and score a big job. Instead, we've had to scale back our expectations again and we've gone off the beaten track. So during the summer, only three jobs came up in top divisions in bigger leagues who weren't at clubs that were already being relegated. Down to the second tier, we applied for a job in Scotland. We headed over to Edinburgh, where Hibs were looking for a new manager. The interview went well. They even offered us the job. But in a league that contains the old firm duo of Celtic and Rangers, we decided that we would just be setting ourselves up for a season at a club where we could never achieve success. So next it was off to Denmark and this time to a Denza Ball Club, a club who only had mid-table expectations and another club that was in dire financial troubles just like Schalke. Again, the chances of us being able to overthrow the top teams in the nation seemed pretty slim, so we pressed on and looked elsewhere. But the only other job that was available was in Belgium's top flight, but not at Anderlecht, nor at Club Bruges, or even at Racing Hank. The most prestigious job available this summer was at Zulte Varagam. Now, we were tempted by this job because they had one player who was the top scorer in the league last season who we thought we might be able to build a team around. But the rest of their squad was aging and some of their best players were leaving. And so it left us scratching our heads as to where we might end up next. So all in all, it was a rather disappointing summer. I thought there might be some big clubs in big leagues, but the only ones that became available were at teams like Hamburg who were exiting out of the Bundesliga and other clubs from across Europe's top leagues, but that were all being relegated out of those divisions. And we decided against a second season running where we would be taking charge of a second tier club. So instead, we thought outside of the box once more and we've headed back to a continent we know well. So whenever the job market goes a little bit flat in our mercenary adventure, we tend to end up managing an African nation. Initially, I wasn't considering a return to international management until I read the comments of Simon Thornley after the last video. About six seasons ago, it was Benin. Now we've landed at Ivory Coast, taking over La Elephant, and they've still got some pretty decent players in their ranks. And because we are in the 29-20-30 season, there is a World Cup on the horizon, if only we could qualify for it. So here's the background to our appointment. Ivory Coast have just taken part in the African Cup of Nations. They've lost to Senegal on penalties at the quarterfinal stage. So they decided to sack their manager and we take in charge just in time for a friendly against Uruguay before some crucial World Cup qualifiers. There is a little bit of a problem. We have played two games already and we've only got four points. We're lagging behind Mali. Of course, who is the team that we dropped points against in our previous World Cup qualifier? Our old friends over at Benin, who've been drawn in the same group as us. However, we've still got Mali to play in this group, both home and away, and I think we're going to need to do the double over them in order to finish top of our World Cup qualification group. If we could do that, we would then qualify for the second stage where we have a playoff against one of the other African group winners and the victors of that tie would go to the World Cup that's going to be held next summer. It's going to be a tall order. Mali have got some strong players as well. But let's introduce you to the players that we've got in our squad. So the 2030 World Cup is going to be held in Spain where the defending champions will be England. The 2022 World Cup was won by Croatia. Let's show you the players who hopefully are going to take us to those finals. Undoubtedly, the area of the pitch where I think we are struggling for a key player is probably in goal. Our number one looks like it's going to be 
Nicholas T, a 28-year-old who's got 13 caps, is currently a backup keeper at Santa Clara, but has not played very much football at all over the last three seasons since moving out to Portugal. So it might be that we're going to struggle with a top flight stopper. Fortunately, we are going to have a good defense in front of him. And we'll start with the center backs where we've got four or five pretty good options. One of those is Sonali Diamande. He is out with Stuttgart. Potentially could be worth 26 million. He's got 31 caps. He's an all round pretty solid performer. He's also played for Leon in the past and had a little spell out in Bulgaria. Alongside him, I think we've got another strong stopper in the form of Mark Gaye. Now, to my knowledge, he's played for England in real life in the Nations League and I think is committed to that nation. But in this parallel universe, he switched allegiances and is now playing for the Ivory Coast. He's with Crystal Palace, who are no longer in the Premier League. He's just played 32 games for them in the Championship. But he looks like a pretty classy central defender. Love the concentration, love the strength. Great marking as well. Only six foot, so he's going to need a dominant force alongside him. That could be Diamande, but on the bench, we've got another English championship player in the form of Cedric Kipra, who is six foot four, has got strength of 18, and looks like he could be a very airily dominant presence. But we could always bring him into the side as well. At fullbacks, I think we are blessed. A player who could play as a left sided centre half is Jonathan Panzo. 12 caps for him. He's playing for Borussia Dortmund. I say playing. A little bit of a bit part player, but he will be good friends with Uwe Furstenhofer, I would imagine. So we could keep us updated on how the Hoff is performing. He's not ideally suited to being a left back. He's six foot one and his crossing is not great. But I think to get him into the team, we should play him there. And then over at right back, we've got arguably our best player. Wilfried Singho is with Atletico Madrid. It's incredibly quick with pace and acceleration of 17. Can take on a man like a winger with dribbling of 15. And with passing of 14, vision of 12 and crossing of 13. And probably put some pretty good balls into the box. Again. We're going to have an entire back four that's over six foot with Singo weighing in at six foot three. So we should be strong in the air and also strong at set pieces, hopefully. Let's move into the midfield now where we've got one standout performer, I would say, backed up by some more good players. This is our captain, Hamed Traore, who's with Newcastle and potentially worth £76 million. Newcastle signed him for £50 million from Sassuolo and I think Traore looks a bit special. Flair of 16, off the ball of 17, first touch and technique and agility all look superb. Two-footed, likes to run with the ball, tries killer balls as well. I think this could be the supply line to our front players and then backing him up in central midfield. First of all, we're going to have Adailan Kasunu who is playing for Borussia Dortmund. Again, another player that's highly valued, potentially as much as 81 million. Another tall player at six foot three. A jumping reach of 18 means that he's going to be our midfield ball winner. Could be playing anywhere in the back line, but we're going to move them into a midfield berth where they're going to try and provide a little bit of security for our defence alongside Suleiman Samaki Kante, a player contracted to Monaco, but currently out on loan at Guangdong. Only 19 years old, he's got a little bit of developing to do, but the bravery and the determination are already superb. So for a ball-winning midfielder with tackling of 12 and work rate of 15, that role might just suit Kante and gives us some good defensive options in midfield so that Traore can be more attacking and that we can have a front three that hopefully are going to win us games. Starting over on the left with Shaka Traore, who's got great balance, great agility and great dribbling. It's going to be a really explosive presence for us. Likes to run with the ball down the left, even though they are right footed. Hopefully playing them as an inverted winger will mean that they can go down the line or cut inside and hopefully support our forward play. Then over on the right, we're going to have Ahmad Diallo, who's at Villarreal. Again, the agility is good. 
We've got good pace and acceleration with this player as well. The first touch and the flair look very neat and tidy, as does the technique. They've played pretty well in La Liga for Villarreal this season. They've played 32 games. They've got five goals. They've got six assists, averaged over a seven for the third season running, having previously played for Man United in the Premier League. So Diallo does have a little bit of pedigree, and we're hoping that this will be a good creative supply line for a striker that I think has got goals in them as well. This is Jatro Fafana, who currently plays for Marseille who might be worth anything up to £51 million, but could be on the move this summer as Atletico Madrid are also interested. We've got incredible pace in our side, and Fafana is another one that offers it. Acceleration of 17, agility of 16, dribbling of 14, pace of 16. Imagine that running at you in the World Cup. You're going to be terrified. He's going to work hard for us up front. He's got great determination. And the finishing and the composure are just about good enough for an international marksman. This is another player that's had a good season in a top league, averaging 7.10 for Marseille over the 27 appearances. They've notched 20 goals in two seasons. So hopefully, Fafana might be the player that can fire us towards the World Cup. We have got a big game coming up that we're going to bring you next episode as we take on Mali at home in a must-win game in our World Cup qualification group. But today, we've got a friendly, where we're going to try and work out who our best players are, and we'll show you exactly who we're up against in our latest scout report. For our first game as Ivory Coast boss, we're heading to Uruguay and to the capital of Montevideo, where we have a friendly fixture against the national team. Uruguay boasts stars such as Bentoncourt, Arezzo, Nunez and Araujo. And we'll be pitting our wits against the managerial brilliance of Marcelo Mendes as Uruguay take on Ivory Coast in an international friendly. So this is undoubtedly a little bit of a risk. We could have played it safe and gone to Hibs and had a mid-table expectation. We could have gone to Denmark and managed a Denza, where again, halfway up the league was the most that would have been expected to us. Or we could have pitched up in Belgium for VAR again, where the expectations were similarly modest. Instead, we've decided to try and pitch our tent in a World Cup qualification campaign that could go spectacularly wrong. If we lose to Mali in the next game, the chances of us qualifying for a World Cup are incredibly slim. Even if we finish top of our qualification group, we're then going to have a very difficult playoff against a fellow African giant in order to try and gain a place at the 2030 tournament. So it could be that this is going to be a season that ends in tragedy. But if we could make it, what an addition to our CV it would make if we could be a World Cup managing coach. Diego Rossi has put Uruguay into the lead inside 25 minutes. So 35 minutes into the game, and we've not looked great so far. We've only had one shot on target. Uruguay have definitely made all the running. I guess this is quite a long trip for a lot of our players who are just at the end of their domestic seasons. But we've put our strongest, or what I see as our strongest lineup, out onto the pitch. And we'd like to see a little bit more from them. Dartro is flying down the right, gets the ball to Ahmad. And now Singo, who could be an absolute revelation for us, is on the ball. And now we've got it with Gaye, and we're looking to try and penetrate this Uruguayan defence. They are well set up defensively. Every player looks like they are well marked, but we've worked a bit of space for Singo and he's delivered. That could be an offside goal, I think. Datro has fired it into the net. We're looking, we're looking for the linesman flag and it has gone off. He was only marginally offside and it shows what Singo could be like delivering from the right. But unfortunately, it's been disallowed. We are into one more highlight before half time, and Fuentes is on the ball for Uruguay. And it looks like it's going to be our opponents that are going to have another chance this game. It's Fuentes again. Now to Rodriguez. And he's looking to raid down our left. He gets a ball in, and they probably should have scored a second. We do look a little bit looser at the back than I thought our strong defense might be. So I thought we had a pretty strong front three, but they've offered absolutely nothing so far. All of them were playing poorly. 
So I've bought Jeremy Boga, who's now 32, on as a replacement player. We've got a highlight in the 71st minute. It's been a quiet second half. And unfortunately, it's not us that's in possession. It's Uruguay once more. They're on the edge of our box, going nowhere, marshaled by two players. But they've still got the ball and Torres gets it into Arezzo. And he swung a ball back to Torres. And again, it's a chance for Uruguay. And we are offering precious little. I think it's time for some reinforcements. Uruguay are attacking us once more. I've just made an entire raft of changes. And it's led to us giving away a penalty in the box. Singo might be good going forward. Not so hot defensively on that occasion. We had so many poor performances amongst our squad. Many of them pulling 6.2s, 6.3s and 6.4s. I've bought on an entire front three now. Maybe I need to have a little rethink about who our strongest players were. Maybe have a little rethink about this 4-3-3 with wide player system that I'm playing. I'm not sure that's worked particularly well. We are up against a good side, to be fair. I've noticed some pretty familiar names in their lineup today. But we've not really had much of a sniff, have we? Four shots on target in the entire game. The XG is 0 0.29. We've been well beaten in that game. And I think we've got much work ahead of us. At least by the time we come back for that Marley game, our players will all have had an off-season, hopefully to recharge and come back significantly stronger than they've shown today because I think a win is going to be vital against Marley if we're going to set up a qualification where we might be able to progress to the latter stages of the African World Cup qualifiers. Whilst we go away and rest our squad and think about who we're going to pick next, this could be your next video and you never know, we might have a suggestion for you that could just be the basis of your next football manager adventure in this video here.